Welcome to the Integrated Schools Podcast. I'm Andrew, a white dad from Denver. And I'm Val, a black mom from North Carolina. And this is the first ever year-end mailbag episode. Yes. So do you have any funny mail stories? <laughs> funny mail stories? So I have a confession about mail. Okay, I am go. notoriously bad at mailing it. Yeah. And I've been married for 15 years. And the very kind guest who attended my wedding never got their thank you letters, but it's not because they it's aren't. Yet. They haven't. They haven't yet gotten their thank you Andrews, letters. But they have stamps. Like it's so. It's not even that they oh, wow. are not. Written, you just have to take them handwritten to the stamps addressed. They just never. It's, you don't want to. You don't want to rush it, Val. You don't they never made it. it. They never make made sure it they them. haven't yet made it. So they give haven't up. yet. They haven't yet made it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you for coming to my wedding. <laughs> Count it. Yeah. Count it. I feel bad for our postal carrier. He is overworked and underpaid. Crazy. Oh, my. All right. Yeah. Shout out to all of our people Shout out delivering to... mail. For real. For we real. appreciate you. None of the questions that we have to answer came through the postal service, however. <laughs> they all came in <laughs> via electronic form, direct messages on social media. Shout out to emails. everyone who's getting our electric mail to us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the internets. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got we've got some great questions and we're just going to jump right in to maybe kick things off here. Alex asks, uh, during the Integrated Schools first webinar, one parent mentioned the challenges of birthday parties mm -hmm. and all the other Integrated Schools parents knowingly laughed. As someone whose child is not yet enrolled in school, what is the story with birthday parties? Any pitfalls to avoid as we strive to know better and do better? Birthday party pitfalls. When my kids were in preschool, we had a group of friends, all of us, and there's literally somebody's birthday party. It felt like at least once a month. And we mm -hmm. all went to the same like bounce house place, yeah. yep. <laughs> same yep. pizza, same everything. And and the, and the kids never grew tired of it. Our family was the only black family in this group, um, which was fine at the time. I think, you know, looking back now, we never had conversations about race with these folks, but the idea that our children kind of define our adult social group, like we create these, right. these groups based around our children and access to school. And so we get friendly with folks our kids go to school with, even though they wouldn't necessarily be folks that we would hang out with all the time. And so I think there was a lot of, it wasn't like, it didn't feel like pressure at the time, but there was the expectation that we kind of hung out together and our kids were involved in the right. same things. And mm -hmm. um, and then after the 2016 election, none of them talked to me. So uh, that's the end of that story. <laughs> I feel like you got a little bit of a hint of the white secrets. There is yeah. that pressure. It's like, oh, well, you should be involved in this activity because mm -hmm. it's the right activity. It's the best activity. And uh, yeah, there is that kind of pressure. And then if if your whole day is spent driving your kids around to various activities, then oh my. your only hope for friendship is other people who are doing those same activities. Yeah. And so when they when we invited them to our birthday parties, obviously the groups were more diverse. We knew other kids who did not go to the school and um, it was all fine. The kids were little and they all had a good time. And so I think any advice for the birthday party situation is, one, you know, you don't have to go to all of them. <laughs> there was a lot of pressure to do that. And in that, I just wish we had more authentic conversations about the world and what we are expecting and yeah in my mind birthday parties and and play dates are sort of tied together you know this mm -hmm. sense that our kids should all be playing together and i think that that one of the cultural expectations that that i bumped up against and that i certainly know a lot of other white parents have bumped up against is this idea like well let's just have a play date and you will just like send your kid over to my house mm. and i don't even know you that's weird <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah, one of my daughter's good friends in kindergarten, her mom was a teacher at the school. And so I felt like there was like some kind of connection there. Like, oh, like, what, you know, like, why don't you, you come over? And she was like, sure. And, and she was like, is it okay if my husband and I also come over? I was like, yeah, great. Oh, like, awesome. Right, right. But there was very much a sense of like, I'm not sending my kid into your house unless I have done my reconnaissance first. Right. And I totally understand that now. I think I didn't fully grasp it at the time. And I mean, it probably speaks to general confidence in like the systems and structures to protect mm. my kids in the world. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, 
you're going to watch my kid instead of me. <laughs> that sounds good. Take her, you know, like, mm-hmm. like go for it. And I think just like acknowledging the different things we bring into that interaction, because there's a, I, I know a lot of folks who are like, oh, like I tried to have six play dates and none of them worked out. So like, I must be doing this wrong or my kid's not making enough friends or like, there's this mm-hmm. kind of like pressure to like you, like your pressure to go to all the white birthday parties. There's this like sense. Okay. I just like, I, I showed up in this integrating school. There's only a handful of white kids. I want to like have play dates with some of the black kids because I want to like expand <laughs> their horizons. Mm-hmm. And, and the parents are kind of like, mm, yeah, not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And, and it can feel like, uh, can feel like failure. I think. That's interesting. You're seeking some belonging in this community. Um, I'm trying to figure out how parents can do that authentically, right? Because the birthday parties are not for us per se, right? They're for the kids right. to, to hang out. And so maybe that isn't the place that we have really meaningful conversations. Yeah, the, the like tool for building connection and building community that might happen at a mostly white school is often play dates. And I mm. think that that for parents who are showing up in integrating spaces, like setting that aside and figuring out other ways to try to build community, try to get to know people. I don't know what the things are, but I think uh, asking someone to trust you with their kid may be a a leap too far, at least at the very beginning. Did you have a lot of those play dates growing up? Because I was thinking about my own experience. Like we had like a set of friends. I could go over their house whenever, you know, my mom had been friends with their mom forever, but we didn't do a lot of play dating. Yeah, I, I start to feel like an old person because because I feel like back in my day, yes. you know, like yeah, like the it. block. There were like mm-hmm. something like eighteen kids under under the age of thirteen on mm-hmm. my block, and so there was this real sense of like it, it was a village a little bit. Like everybody's right. parenting everybody. In general, it was sort of like yeah, you just like go go everywhere. And right. I, I wish that my kids had some of that. And there's this sense of like everything needs to be scheduled. And I think that may be where like the drive for playdates come from. They need X number of minutes of playdates every day. And then there's, okay, well, so let's schedule it because it's not going to just happen automatically. I'm nodding vigorously over here because yeah, when you were talking, it really was like, just go outside and whatever (laughs) kids were outside, (laughs) those were the kids you played with. Like you played with the kids in the neighborhood because there wasn't so much structured time. And so when I like look outside now and I'll tell my kids, y'all go outside. One will, the other one was like, uh, there's books. <laughs> um, and so, um, but he'll just go outside and play basketball by himself. And I'll say, Hey, you know, there's a kid who, um, waits in front of our house for the bus every morning. I'm like, you want me to like ask him his name, see if y'all want to play basketball. And my son's like, please don't, don't. please <laughs> don't ever do that. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't expect this to come out of the, the birthday question conversation, but I think what you shared was a significant aha for me is that in the scheduling of all of these activities for, for our children to make them like the perfect model or prepare them in the perfect way or to set them apart from other children, we, we lose the, the authentic opportunities. They just like go outside and play and meet some make kids, some friends. make some yeah. friends. Yeah. And then I think, you know, layered on top of that is like how segregated so many neighborhoods are. Mm-hmm. If you want your kid to have a diverse group of friends, just like going outside may not actually get them there. Right. They, they may be surrounded by other kids who look just like them if they go outside. One of the real benefits of my kids being in the school they are is the group of friends that they have built who, who are all different from them in all sorts of ways. I want to be able to foster that, but I think I think it's easy to show up as a white person and be like, hey, like, you know, send your kid over to my house. Mm-hmm. Parents are like, nope, nope. not going to do it. No, nope. I'm not doing nope. that. Nope. Mm-hmm. I don't know you. Nope, yeah. absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that question, listener. Thank you, Alex. Um, let's see. Tom wrote uh, wrote to us on Twitter. For those of us who follow your community but don't have school aged children, what are effective ways for us to engage in a mission that is in line with, perhaps, but perhaps adjacent to, that of integrated schools? How can we show up as maybe formerly school aged parents, or thinking about someday becoming parents, or maybe not really on the parent train at all? Yeah. How do people support the cause? I think that's an awesome question because I'm graduating soon, right? And I hope. I mean, and soon is relative, but you know how years go these days. It'll be yeah. no time. And so um, I imagine myself to continue to be a fierce advocate for this cause. And I think for me, I'll probably be able to show up a couple of different ways. I'll probably have a lot more time to go to school board meetings. <laughs> it yep. seems like 
black people without school school age kids are spending a lot of time in school board meetings these days. Yep. So I'll have time to do that. And and you know that's an example of being more um, civically active in what's happening, right? And understanding that having a highly educated and, you know, equitably educated population helps all of us. Right. And so I'm not supporting efforts that undermine the funding of schools. I'm talking to other people about those very things. I can certainly volunteer in schools Yeah, and I can volunteer in a school across like a racial difference. Right. So that it's not just me in my own community. Like I'm actually trying to work across difference. What are some of your ideas? Yeah, the, the the volunteering in schools piece definitely the, like that's been on my mind a lot lately. I think particularly given how stressed out teachers are right now. Thinking back mm-hmm. to the last episode and you know the the shortage of just like adult bodies to show up in schools, whether that's to clean the bathrooms or watch the kids or serve lunch or whatever it is. Like just actually showing up and setting foot inside of a of a school, you know, both takes some strain off that school, mm-hmm. which is great. But also certainly across difference, you you know, you end up seeing a school, particularly a school that maybe like everybody in the neighborhood talks about as being terrible or failing or some other way has like a bad rating. I think when you actually walk inside a lot of those schools, like, oh, like, look at those beautiful kids who that's are learning. It. Look at the love that's in this building. Look that's at the, the things that are going on. And so I think that is that is powerful. And then, yeah, I think, you know, you're right, right, showing up and advocating for policies that are actually beneficial. But I think your ability to do that is even greater if you have spent some time, mm-hmm. you know, you, you've become part of a community. So even though you don't have a kid, and to your point, it's not like a, a purely selfless act. Right. If, if our schools are doing better, we're all doing better. We all benefit from it. And so showing up and building community in a school and by volunteering, by getting to know some kids, by getting to know some teachers, then it's like, oh, you know what? You know where my voice would actually be really helpful is at the school board because they're talking about closing down the school. Right. Add my voice to to this cause in some way. And I feel like there's a that's another opportunity. Yeah. You know, I appreciate the question because I think it's easy to lose sight of such an important institution when you don't have a a loved one actively participating in it. Right. So understanding the importance of schools um, is awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I think, I think we've got a quick one here. Dana asks, where are the school districts with high percentage of black and brown students who have ongoing meaningful feedback loops where parents, including non-English speaking parents are made to feel like partners in their children's education? Um, Well, I certainly believe that there are pockets of those places and they are probably primarily staffed by black and brown educators who are committed to that type of work for their student body. You know, if I think about just general public schools, um, I think this is when you insert the cricket noise. (laughs) (laughs) And not to be mean, but I think we have so much work to do in ways that affirm the dignity and humanity of all of our students. Um, and again, you'll have pockets, you'll have teachers who are doing it. Right. You'll have some schools that are doing it. But I think if we look across the country and I've been looking, you know, I want to know, I want to visit, I want to see, I want to learn yeah. from the kids and the educators who are in that building and hear from the parents. And I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. If it was happening at scale somewhere, we would know about it. Yep. I think there are also probably a lot of teachers and administrators who would like for it to happen, but there are so many structural things that are in the way of that, in ter- just in terms of the demands on their time, the structures that exist for meaningful feedback, and even just the kind of the ways that the the kind of professionals, the people who have the PhDs, not that there's anything wrong with getting a PhD. Yeah, better not be. <laughs> I'm close. <laughs> but, um, you know, that there's this sense like, well, well they're, they're the experts and so they must know. And, and, and a sense that that expertise is more valuable than the expertise of the parents and the families. Mm. In the sense of like, well, parents don't really know what they, what they want because they don't understand the literature and they don't know this thing and they haven't read this study and whatever. And so, it, mm. you know, both serves to not allow the space for parent voice to, to, to show up. And yeah. then if, when parents do show up, they feel like ignored and they're like, well, why nothing changed? I came, I talked a whole lot. Yeah. I said all these things that were important to me and nobody actually listened or changed anything. So why should I keep doing it? Yeah. I think it's quite, um, <laughs> quite egotistical for folks to think that parents don't know their kids and what their kids need. Right. And so right. we should, as educators, humbly come to parents and try to get to understand what they know about their kids and what their kids need 
and take that into consideration when we're doing this collective planning, this collective learning experience, right? So like the teacher has a level of expertise, the parents have a level of expertise specifically about the child. And when you right. teach, you don't teach content, you teach children, right? And so like, how right. do we make sure that we are honoring the expertise that parents have about their own children? That right. is the same, as a partnership. That's the same heart. Right. As a partnership, right. I mean, that's the other piece I feel like, particularly for white and privileged parents often fall into is like, well, t- the uh, teachers are sort of replaceable yeah, automatons. No. Like if they just like read the right stuff, like it doesn't matter. And so there's this, there is this need to elevate the expertise of teachers mm-hmm. and the expertise of parents and yeah. then finding ways. I mean, I think Zoe talked about this last time about, you know, how do we build on collaboratively right. to make sure that all of our kids are getting what they need to actually be able to learn. Right. So... Thank you for that question, Dana. Thank you. I, I wish we had more uh, hopeful answers, but um, we're hopeful. Someday. Though. And and <laughs> listeners, if you if you know of a spot where it's really working well, where that kind of community feedback loop is happening, definitely hit us up and let us know because we'd love to learn more about it. Yeah, make sure well. if you're white that some black folks co-sign you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not just like it feels to you, white mom, that like everybody listens to you. That is not actually what we're looking for. Right, right. Let's make sure some people of color have agreed. Yep. So we've got a great question here from Gina. Um, She says, in my home area, there is a lot of opposition to school integration. Groups of parents that are actively opposed to integration. They fought rezoning a couple years ago that would have made schools across the system more integrated. They were successful. Now our school system remains extremely segregated, Mm. aside from a small handful of folks who are choosing integrated or integrating schools. Mm. So her question is, how do we effectively deal with the somewhat organized groups of parents who fight measures that would integrate the school system? The usual talking point fall on deaf ears or incite white fragility and cries of I'm not racist, but Hmm. we have so much potential in our district and even administrators and board members who are willing to make changes, but it doesn't take off. What do you do about these kind of the organized white folks who are opposed to the idea of integration at all? Well, there can definitely be organized white folks who are in support of integration, right? Um, And I think one of the things that I wish I saw more of is people who are not working from a place of fear and actually speaking out in support of that. And I'm not talking about the parents who are already doing it. I'm talking about the ones who are pretty silent. And I think we've kind of touched on this before, that the whole draw of whiteness must be really strong for me to, you know, just remain silent when I know something is wrong, right? For me to feel like Um, If I speak up, then I'm losing my community, my family, my friends. And so that's why the integrated schools space um, for for white folks in particular, I think it's a really important community to cultivate because in many ways, we are asking white folks to go against the status quo and they need a place to land. They need a soft place to land when they get shunned by the rest of their family members, right? I can't imagine that level of pain and separation from people that I love and who have, um, you know, loved me as a child and did the very best they could. And so it makes me, it makes me wonder, like, why sometimes, you know, we're okay with racist friends. Like, why, 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 (laughs) why? Like, what are they offering to you? That is so meaningful, important, awesome that walking away from that um, for, you know, a reality that is integrated and richer, richer in, you know, yeah. human experience. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You need to tell me a secret on this one. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I think a piece of it is about the no man's land in between. Right. Like you you don't immediately disown mm-hmm. all your racist friends and then have this multiracial group of friends instantly. Right. Mm-hmm. Like there's work to do. And and it's I think it's often slower. I mean, going back to the play date thing a little bit like, yeah, there is it. There is ease in building relationships, at least surface level relationships with people who are similar to you. Mm-hmm. Right. It's easy to start talking about the similar things when you're all enrolling your kids in the same activities and going on the same sorts of vacations and living, you know, similar lives and similar neighborhoods and similar sized houses, like all those things make the surface level much easier. And so I think that, that getting rid of that requires more investment in, in relationships that have the potential to pay off much more, but it's, it's like that fear of letting go 
And in some ways, I think you do have to let go of it because like, yeah, it's it's hard to build a multiracial group of friends if some of them are racists. Right. right. Like that. That makes it right. hard to kind of uh, you can't you know, your birthday party gets real awkward real fast. Right. So like, how do you, you know, trust that there is something better on the other side to be able to let go of that? You know, you know, thinking back again, that that birthday party question was brilliant. So it got us thinking about all types of things. But um, and thinking back to my own separation from people who I care deeply about and considered friends, it was very difficult, right, for that to be severed and to speak to no man's land. You know, I already had another community in which to, to find comfort. So, right. You know, that was just my kids' school community. It wasn't my whole life, my whole right. community. And so if it's your whole life, right, and who knows how long that middle time is, right? right? When Particularly you're trying... in the midst of COVID where, where right. you can't actually, like, meet new people or be in, yeah. I mean, that's that's yeah. really tough. And so I'm imagining white folks who are pro-integration feeling super frustrated when they look at their neighbors and their friends who they know could be speaking up for it and and aren't even in opposition but are just silent right yeah being like super frustrated with that right because you are offering them a place to go you are offering them a a vision and a future that is um more of the communities in which we want to live and grow and learn and so i'm just encouraging folks who are are silent to have a lot more courage and I'm, I'm going to encourage the folks who are doing the work uh, to keep it up because you don't know like which one of the conversations will be the bridge for that next person. Like you have no right. idea. To build the community and grow, grow that soft space to land that people need. Yeah. The fear of losing connection is real yeah. for sure. And there is some kind of leap of faith. And I think, you know, I mean, it's one of the things I think about the things that white supremacy costs white people which which is not to say that they are comparable to the things that it costs everybody else, but there is a cost to white people. And they're like, there are not the same kind of cultural spaces to fall back on when you're like, you know what? I'm getting rid of my racist friends. You don't have your black church. You don't have the barbershop. There's like these other institutions that I think people of color have built to support themselves in, you know, pushing back against white supremacy mm-hmm. and, and there, there aren't similar institutions for white people. Mm-hmm. I mean, some people find them in, in places, but like te- they tend to also be all white spaces that then carry some of these same, yeah. these same challenges. That sounds scary. I mean, yeah. And <laughs> yes. I mean, and I, yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the end? Tell me the end. <laughs> well, like, and we, you know, like it, a little, yeah, it's not as scary as being Ruby Bridges and having oh, of course, you know, pipe bombs, right? Like, yeah. yes, it is scary. And it is not like threatening to our physical well-being. Mm. It is not threatening in the same ways that racism and white supremacy impact. That's interesting. Of color. Yeah. And, and maybe I, maybe it felt scary sounding to me in that moment because I've always lived with that other type of impact of white supremacy. Right. So that is super normalized. I don't know. White supremacy. Yeah. It's not worth it, y'all. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's, not, it's worth not worth it. Yeah. That was a good one. That was a good one. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Gina. So our good friend Courtney Martin has a question. What is a question that you are carrying around with you about parenting these days? Hmm. I feel like a number of our conversations have sort of come back to this kind of what do we do with our kids? How do we teach them the lessons we want to teach? What are you thinking about in terms of questioning parenting these days, Val? Yeah, we talk a lot my kids and I about any number of things, but I think what my father did very, very well is we had a really structured black history curriculum, you know? Mm. And so um, I felt like certainly by their age, I knew so many people, what they did and point points of history. Like I was well aware of all of those things. And while my, my kids are able to make connections to present day injustice and like generally broad, historical injustices like the specificity that i knew folks and their their contributions i haven't given that to my kids in that same way and so i was just thinking about that um this week actually and ways in which to do that so that they are equipped with knowing like what contributions black people specifically have made to this country that aren't just like generic why do you think that is why do i think that you haven't that you haven't done that I went to all black schools 
And so many of these conversations, even some of these people that my dad helped me to know, were also talked about in our school curriculum, right? And so Mm -hmm. I think I assumed that they would get a little more from school. I feel like they get less now, and it probably is like with the standardized testing movement. And yet I still haven't made it a a priority. Like my dad even used to have like the stick of knowledge, and he would have all of these like black and white pictures of black historians and authors and musicians on it and he'd like turn it like who is this what are they done what are their accomplishments so like yeah it was like real structured kind yeah. of learning and i just haven't invested that type of time in it yeah. they know a lot more than i'm giving them credit for right now but i i feel like right. they could know even more so what i've been thinking about lately there's two things i'm not i'm sure they are related somehow but so one of them is i feel like We do a lot of talking about systemic racism, about kind of the ways that systems and structures contribute to disadvantaging people. Mm -hmm. And I think my kids have like a very good grasp of that. And and I try to just like whenever something comes up, talk about, you know, we refinanced our house. And in the process, we're like talking about mortgages and like, how, well, what is a mortgage? Mm-hmm. Like, what does that mean? And like very quickly talking about redlining and talking about, you know, generational wealth and the ways that like we were able to buy a house was because my parents had enough money to loan us some money for a down payment. Mm-hmm. And they had enough money because their parents had enough money to loan them some money for a down payment. And mm-hmm. kids are like totally with it. They got it. And one thing I'm struggling with is to move out of the kind of policy systemic realm and into the more interpersonal realm. Okay. And I'm not sure that the kids would notice the kind of interpersonal ways that, that racism and white supremacy plays out in their day-to-day lives. Mm, why? Like I'm not sure that they are as, as attuned to it as maybe they should be. Why do you think they wouldn't notice? I don't know. Maybe they would. Yeah. <laughs> maybe they would. We haven't had as many conversations about it. I mean, we, you know, like I ask them sometimes, mm-hmm. oh, you're like your, your best friend who's black. Like, do you notice the teachers treating you differently? No, not really. And I feel like okay. probably some of that is real because there is a lot of talk going on at school about those sorts of things and may, you know, it may not be showing up in quite the same ways mm-hmm. that, it, mm-hmm. that it would. But mm-hmm. um, it's also just like, that's a, it's a harder place. I mean, even right now, like it's a, that's a harder place for me to go. It's a harder place for me to talk about with them. Yeah, I think that hmm, was um, me wondering if your intentionality around their school and their friends is why they might not notice it as much. Like if yeah. if your children current level of critical consciousness were in an all white space, would then they then notice it in that right. interpersonal way? You know, I, I went to all black schools. So if you would have asked me then, you know. I would have known it from like a systems way, but certainly not in the way that we were treated at school. And do you think they have the language that they need to talk about it? That's a good question. Yeah. Maybe they, yeah, that may be where my like concern goes. Like, I'm not sure that they do. Mm -hmm. What is the actual language for white children talking about what they see in terms of racism around them? Like what language do they use? Is it different? What language is it for black kids? This is racist. <laughs> My teacher's racist. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it, th- what's what's really interesting about that, like, like I think that on the one level, like, yeah, I think they should, if they see mm-hmm. racism, they should call racism. But I also worry that there is this, A, a that it just like, you know, people start just like throwing that around. Like you said black, so that's racist. And sort yeah. of like losing the context. Like, oh, like, you know, pass me that black crayon. Oh, that's racist. But so I think mean, that, that's one <laughs> piece. Do that the, too. The, yeah. But I think the other piece is like, I, I don't want them to only associate the explicit, outwardly hostile acts of white people as racism, mm-hmm. because I think that's a way that that we white people can distance ourselves, you know, like, well, that's racist. So I'm not racist. So I'm not part of racism. So I'm not like participate, you know, like yeah. I didn't tell that black kid that they can't come into the store. So so, you know, if that's racism, I'm not doing that. So like my hands are clean. I have a story that I think better answers the question about the language um, so my daughter's in fifth grade and they were like in a circle for reading time. And the teacher asked them to imagine a cold winter day. You have on warm socks, there's a fireplace and you have some hot chocolate. And a white child touched my daughter on the head and said, I have my hot chocolate right here. And so my daughter, she felt emotion and the teacher didn't say anything. And this is the story that she recounted to me when she came home. 
which I appreciate her having, you know, coming and telling me about, yeah. about what happened. And I said, Oh, you had your first microaggression. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and she was like, what's that? Right. And so right. I think children are able to tell the stories of what is happening to them. Um, and it's up to us to help equip them with the language. Mm. And I asked her why she didn't, say anything to the teacher and it was a white teacher and she thought the teacher would say like it's not a big deal uh, don't worry about it. it she didn't right it was just a joke right. so in that fifth grade moment she very much felt like the impact of that um she didn't know to call it a microaggression but no, she knew that mm -mm. she felt something about it right 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 and so i do think through their stories children can share the experience and it's kind of up to us to help give them the language and maybe one way to do it is through media. Like, you know, you're all are watching something. How do you think so-and-so felt? How is this like an interpersonal type of example of what we talk about Racism. on the systems right. level? Yeah. Yeah. And so. Yeah, that's a good idea. From what I know about you, I cannot imagine you living in a way that you are engaged in these conversations weekly and not committed to making these changes for your children in real time. So. I appreciate that. And, and yeah. like, there's, there's no shortage of work to be done. None. You know, I think that's the piece of it is like, it's always, no matter what I do, they, they're constantly getting the other messages, you know? And right. so I could try to like put them in, in environments where they're less likely to get them. I try to put them in, you know, social such situations mm. where, the, but even in the best of circumstances, they still live in America. They're still watching TV. They're still like, you know, it's, so it's like this constant refreshing and kinds of like, oh, yep. Hey, here it comes again. Those points that you made, I feel like are exactly what I do, except my content has to be in their positive racial identity development because right. they're constantly getting the other messages. Right. It's a constant refresher. Your act of helping them unlearn, you know, mine is to actively help them learn to kind of make up that balance for our young people. Yeah. And I will say one way of interpreting that is that like, you have to constantly build your kids up and I have to constantly tear my kids down. And I don't think that's like it at no. all, right? Like mm -mm. my kids are, are, are more comfortable in their skin, are happier, more well-adjusted, the more that they understand that, that racism exists, the more they understand yeah. that there are ways that they are benefiting from being white kids. Like yeah. it doesn't destroy them. You know, I mean, I think there's this fear that like, if you tell white kids that there, there is such a thing as white privilege or something that it's going to, wreck them but i feel like that just like does a disservice to our kids are better than that yeah i'm glad you brought up the way that could be interpreted i think it goes back to that zero sum we can all have healthy <laughs> happy kids right. you know that aren't engaging in racist ideas and right. the end like we can all right. have that yeah you know? right yeah and like taking away white superiority from my kids does not make them inferior no it actually like broadens the the possibility for them to be better people. Right. Right. Yeah. Can I tell you the other parenting thing that I've been struggling with? Yeah, I'm listening. So uh, it's about ancestors. Okay. So I, I've been thinking a lot about ancestors, about, you know, kind of the, the um, another thing that white supremacy has cost white people, <laughs> not to make a, mm -hmm. a theme out of the episode, like, woe yeah. is us white people for white supremacy, but we brought this on ourselves, but is the like <laughs> disconnection from, from our history, from our heritage, from the like generations that went before us. Mm -hmm. And similar to, to the conversation we were just having, there's like a, 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 a tricky balance to walk here because on the one hand, I have a real desire for my kids to feel connected to the generations of people that came before them, mm -hmm. to my family, you know, to the, the, Hungarian stubbornness of my grandfather that like shows up in every conflict I have with my daughter, you know, like mm -hmm. there are these ways that kind of you see this. And I think that that's really important to tap into. Mm -hmm. And you can't go very many generations back. And I, you know, I, I, so my, my father's side is Jewish. My mother's side is, you know, European has been here for a long time, but like you can't go very many generations back before you run into some really problematic ancestors. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with how do I think about acknowledging those ancestors, acknowledging the things that I have taken from them, that my kids take from them, and the ways in which they were wrong, the ways in which they were problematic. It doesn't feel super complicated to me because everybody has problematic ancestors. Like, do you know mm. one family that does not right. have a problematic ancestor? Not a one, right? right. And so yeah. I think understanding that and acknowledging that 
Because what is the what is the desire that you feel to present a pristine image of all your ancestors? Where is that coming from? I don't have that desire. Mm-hmm. I don't want to like ignore or minimize the harm that that my ancestors have done. Mm-hmm. I want to acknowledge that and acknowledge the good things. Sort of like try to hold both of those things. Maybe I just have to hold both at once. Maybe it's uh, not actually it's, that complicated. I, I, that's <laughs> what I was gonna say, but <laughs> well, I think you can say, man, you know, you're ancestor xyz they were gritty and held on and had a farm and did great things and also they also made sure that people of color couldn't farm and so there are certain things that we want to keep and certain things that we know we need to to get rid of right yeah and i do think some of the answer may lie in you know if you're thinking back four five six seven generations what are the next seven generations and how do you like Mm. we, we we are here in this moment between you know, spans of generations, how do we think about taking what we've gotten and leaving something better for the next generations that come? I just had a vision of like an, uh, like an anti-racist journey family tree for white folks. (laughs) All right. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like, yeah, you're on your way. And so, yeah, we weren't always there. Um, but such and such granddad did this and such and such aunt taught me this. Yeah. I wouldn't be here without the steps that are each. Yeah. It's, right. It's generational work though. It's generational work. And that's why white folks need an anti-racist journey family tree. Yeah. <laughs> and and if it starts with you, that's cool too. Yeah. Right. Right. Maybe you're the first. Maybe you're the first. I'm not the first for sure. And um, that's very cool. Yeah. And I think as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, our children can handle like these complex ideas. We often as parents and um, sometimes as educators present these binaries where we can yeah. be like, yeah, it's super messy. And actually our kids are okay with that. They are. That was a good one, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. All right, I've got one here from Aaron. It starts out with a lot of love for you, Val. So I'm going to read it all because because uh, it's good. I've been meaning to write you to let you know how much I appreciate the addition of Val's voice to these conversations. Me too. As a biracial mom raising mixed kids, teaching in a diverse school, my racial experience is often in between. Mm -hmm. Understanding how whiteness works in school culture, particularly the impact of resourced white parents, is really important for looking critically at the school where I teach. And it's also important for me to acknowledge the privilege I experience because of the way I look and am perceived racially, especially by white people, even though I identify as black or biracial. Mm -hmm. The Integrated Schools podcast has been really useful to me, but it's sometimes been hard to find my experience reflected in conversations about race only involving white people. I really appreciate this season and the real-time example of productive cross-racial dialogue. She's also giving you some love. The end. Thank you all for listening. (laughs) Wrap it up. Thank (laughs) you all for listening. But she does have a question. It was not all just love. We're ready. My question for you is, how do you see these issues playing out in schools and communities with different racial balance? The school where I teach is a mixed student population that generally reflects the school age population in the neighborhood. But the teaching staff and administration is majority white. And the existing school culture in terms of Mm. power and involvement has changed very little during the 10 to the 15 years that the school population has become browner. As a self-described liberal or progressive community, there's plenty of talk about celebrating diversity, helping students and families of color access or join school structures. But there's no discussion about systemic racism in schools as a barrier or the need to actually change how schools and classrooms operate. Mm. The unspoken guiding assumption is that the responsibility for greater integration and involvement lies with students and families of color to, quote, join in. Mm. Most of the white teachers and parents either pretend not to notice how race functions in the school or don't believe that their behavior and assumptions contribute to this. What would it look like or sound like to work towards integrating a desegregated school? That's a good question. That's a great question. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Aaron, where do we start? Um, (laughs) So, you know, I find it interesting and not all that unique to the community that Aaron is describing like this happens in many places all over the country. Right. And part of the idea is probably rooted in just having a a misunderstanding of history generally, because that's often how our history is taught. Right. Like the people of color are the add on to the white American story. Right. So when our whole existence, whole country's existence is positioned in that way. It's not surprising that that's how those ideas will show up in schools. And folks of color actually have really good ideas about how their schools should be run. It's not valued in the same way that white parents' ideas are. 
And then we know that when we start talking about changing systems, you know, I believe that every little person is their own little system, right? And so that means we have to change ourselves. And so how attached am I to my gifted, intelligent program and the ways in which I do that? Um, it, it's, it's the way that it is and it has to be this way. And so, right. you know, I can't change that for black and brown kids. They can join if they meet the requirements right. and the requirements just happen to be a teacher has to recommend them, but it just so happens that teachers right. don't always see their gifts. Right. So, um, the work that has to be done. Oh, it's so complex. We need to have conversations about race and racism in schools because these young people will grow up and they will lead systems and they will become the realtors, the principals, the gatekeepers. And because we have missed that opportunity to have the conversation in schools with so many of us, you know, I'm talking about us as adults, we yeah. have to figure out ways to have adult education programs around this as well. I think specifically in schools, professional learning is a significant way that we can we can make a inroads. And I often wonder, like, what do we do for parents who are wondering, like, about these things and have avenues for them to learn? So I'm I'm incredibly grateful for the community you all have because you can leave school, you can leave, you can graduate with a master's degree, and having never had any of these conversations, right. you know. And unfortunately, that's how many folks are entering it, including teachers, right. um, which is kind of scary. Yeah, I think, yeah, that piece of like what what parents can do is not be silent. Like you were saying earlier, is right. like show up for the teacher who wants to have the conversation about it to ask the yeah. teachers like, hey, are we talking about race at all? Like, you know what? You know, that, particularly that right now. That would have gone a long way for me. Like. If a parent came to me and said, hey, I would love, you know, thanks so much for having that conversation or I would love it if you had a conversation about race. I remember one of my children's teachers, uh, it was like a world history class, and she essentially sent an email home apologizing for having to teach about Islam. And the email was written in a way that felt like she was nervous about parent pushback for teaching it. Right. right? So I replied right back. Thank you so much. We can have much more of this. I want my kids right. to be exposed to all types it. of things. And this was several years ago. Uh, it was two years ago. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that, like, turn that up to 11 right now. Right. All of the laws that teachers are like. Right. I don't even know if I can teach this book. I don't know if I can right. say the word black or white. I don't right. know if I can identify that Martin Luther King was black. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Is, yeah. It's rough. So any type of support that parents can give educators who are courageously having these conversations would be great. I don't want parents, especially those of us who are committed to anti-racism in integrated schools, to ever feel ashamed about that stance. Right. And I think there's a lot of shame and fear around having that stance publicly. Because there's no shame or hesitation about the alternate, right? Like None. that is loud and, and yeah. I would also, for, for teachers, shout out the Teaching Hard History podcast. So good. Shout out Learning for Justice. Learning for Justice. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay. Um, let's see. So uh, another Courtney mm -hmm. asks, is there anything that you can pinpoint that has shifted for you personally over the course of having these incredible conversations this season? Mm -hmm. You start. So I feel like there's all sorts of things. It's, this, these conversations have been really a gift. If I had to kind of point to something, I think like the power of and the need for having these conversations in multiracial community. Mm -hmm. the, this podcast has been just a, a gift to me in terms of all the people who are willing to come on. I've had a lot of experts and certainly lots of people of color who have been guests in kind of the expert role. And not to say that you're not an expert, Val, but <laughs> <laughs> that both of us are showing up in our role as parents. Mm -hmm. And having the conversations that way has just been really powerful. And I think... I would have said that that was important, but I don't know that I felt it in the same way prior to really digging into some of these things with you. Yeah. Today, especially, I felt like there was so much that you and I talked about that even though we might have different approaches, our values are the same for what we want for our children. Right. Mm. And I think there are probably times when white folks are enrolling their students in an in integrating school that they don't have the opportunity or don't make the opportunity to to understand that so many of our values 
align, <laughs> right? right. Um, because the conversations aren't actually happening in the way that they are happening for us. I think a lot of times people just need the space, the space to come together and have these conversations. So if I was the principal and I said, hey, we're integrating schools, this is what's happening in our community, love to invite parents in to kind of talk about what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what their hopes are. I think that would go like a, a really long way because I think the dialogues that we're having are like a good models for for our listeners about what is possible when you just kind of grapple with them and you don't have the answers and you're feeling the right. feels. And, you know, I don't always like there are times almost in every conversation I'm like, oh, that hurt. That hurt. Like, so the the, the time in this conversation, and it's not a big deal, but it, it's it's close to home right now when you're talking about buying a house and generational wealth and mortgages and having money to pass, you know, and more money from the families to so that you can have the down payment. And, you know, we're in the process of figuring out if we want to buy a house or not. And, and we don't have, we won't have the same story right. that you have in terms of having that large sum of money passed down and, you know, I was kind of in my feelings about it. So there's never, um, but it, it has nothing to do with you. It was, you know, it's just like, oh, I wish that for no. all of us. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, I just wish that for all of us. And so in every conversation, I am, I am super aware of how our experiences differ. And I am aware of how many of our values are aligned and the work mm-hmm. it takes to, to make sure we elevate that as well. And I appreciate yeah. being able to honestly and show up and say, yeah, it sucks to hear that. <laughs> you know, it sucks that my kids don't have that same experience. And for you to genuinely empathize with me, like, I feel like that is also something that folks of color, if they don't also have authentic relationships with white folks, they don't get that either, you know? And mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. A sort of a sort of similar question, but I, we, at least I have something else to add to it. Katie asks, I've loved learning from your conversation. I'm curious what the most important thing you two have learned from one another. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for sharing your learning with us. All the white secrets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm going to get kicked out. They're going to have you a talking are gonna to get me kicked at the next out. meeting. They are. <laughs> you better not go. Don't go to the next meeting. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good with uh, skipping those meetings. <laughs> I think one of the things that and and this sort of ties to your your most recent answer that I that I've learned from you is is the importance of sort of staying connected to the emotion of all of this mm. because the the emotions are real and they're there and so I think it's it's easy for me often I think to and this probably ties back to the with my kids as well why it's easier to talk about the systems things but it's easy for me to intellectualize to think about mm-hmm. well yeah like like and like yeah I I have generational wealth I shouldn't have generational wealth. I do have generational wealth. I think a lot about like what what is the, you know what's my responsibility now that I have that. How should I sort of redistribute? Like all those things are real, and mm-hmm. that's all in my head. And and you constantly bring me back to the emotion of it. And so it, easy for me to kind of walk right past the mm-hmm. the impact to you not having that same generational wealth emotionally. I I I mean my assumption is that intellectually you understand that it's not like mm-hmm. I didn't choose to have it. It is mm-hmm. like the way the structure of the world, but I think it's easy for me to stay in the structure of the world. And mm-hmm. I think in every episode and every conversation we've had, I feel like there's been a moment where you have brought us back to the emotion of it, to the to the way that it feels, the way that you imagine it feels, the way that you have experienced it feeling, mm-hmm. the way that we should be acknowledging the feelings. And that has been really also a gift to me. Yeah. You've given me, and, you know, I jokingly say the white secrets, but you've given me a lot of insight into some of the things that white folks are grappling with when they're trying to do this work. And I think that's important for me to know as someone who is committed to a future in which we, we do have many integrated spaces. It's easy to be frustrated with the system of white supremacy and... I think sometimes that frustration can be directed at white people specifically. And it's really easy to lose sight that there are humans also grappling with these very difficult things as they're trying to make change, generational change, as you say, right? And so all of these conversations, I think, deepen my own sense of empathy for just how much we all have to fight to get to the other side. Mm. Um, mm, yeah. 
because as I, w- I was, you know, reflecting about the, the losing your whole entire community, that's a lot. And that's something that I won't ever have to sacrifice to do this work. So like, there's things that you will never experience, you know, like we talked about, like, I won't have the generational wealth, but I also won't lose my entire community by doing this work. Right. Right. And so my generational wealth shows up a little bit differently from, from yours. That, yes, that is, that is it. And that, yeah. And it's beautiful. And, and like, yeah, my generational wealth puts a roof over my head, which is, which means something. And Mm -hmm. there's this like beautiful sense of black community Mm -hmm. that I don't get to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And I don't have something comparable to to mm-hmm. lean on. And I mean, I think, you know, part of part of the work, one piece of the work of integrated schools is to try to kind of create some sense of that community, something to to fall back on that is not about celebrating whiteness, but that is somehow celebrating white people. Mm-hmm. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Maybe. Because, yeah, I mean, right. On the one hand, it's like wh- this, it shouldn't be this hard, right? Like no. on the one hand, it's simple. There is something like profound in loving one another. There is something profound in like, we are all humans. And so we should just like treat each other that way. And w- we've got 400 years of crap to to dig through yeah. before we can do that simple thing. And it's not easy <sighs> for anybody. Yeah. 400 years of crap to do that very simple thing. But I think that speaks to the power of that simple thing. Yeah. I don't I don't think as humans, we were designed to, to live in, in a way that we're in opposition of one another, that we're hurting one another, that we are trying to be superior over one another. I believe it's possible to do that very simple thing and wait through that 400 years together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so grateful to you for the... And I feel like that we're like... This is not the end. Right. We're still going to be here in January. Yeah, I'm coming We're not back. saying goodbye, but <laughs> it is the it is the end of the year. I feel like a good time to kind of pause and reflect um, yeah. on on the gift that you have been uh, in the podcast, in these conversations, but um, also just in my life. I'm so grateful for you and glad to glad to be able to call you friend. I am too. Like when you caught on today, I was like, it's my friend Andrew. Like I was just very happy to see you. So um, thank you for inviting me into this conversation, for allowing me to be my authentic self and for what you're trying to do, the whole entire integrated schools community in terms of making sure that the space is really integrated for all of us. Yeah. We got to be the model because, yeah. you know, like our time here is relatively short. So yeah, and right. How do we, how do we leave it slightly better? That's it. Pass on the baton at the end of our marathon to the That's next it. marathon runner and That's it. leave it a little bit better off. Well, we have lots, lots more to come in the new year, many more conversations, much more to do. And in order to do that, listeners, I know it's a time where lots of organizations are asking for your support and contributions and money. And uh, there are lots of worthy causes out there. And we hope that you have found some value in these conversations. We do not waste any of your time in the midst of these conversations trying to sell you toothbrushes or underwear. Um, So that doesn't mean that this uh, work is all free. So we would be very grateful for your support. You can go to patreon.com slash integrated schools, join us, um, get transcripts and access to the happy hours and all sorts of things and show us a little bit of support if this work has been valuable to you. Thank you all for listening and your financial support in this very important work that we're doing. And Val, it's always a pleasure to be in this with you as I try to know better and do better. Oh my gosh, next time will be next year. Twenty twenty two is gonna be dope. And it better be. What we said about twenty twenty one. It's gotta be something. Make sure this makes the outtakes. <laughs> twenty twenty two is gonna be something. <laughs> <laughs>